on wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the chance-bought F4U Corsair. To this day, the Corsair is believed by many to be the best piston engine fighter ever built. Arriving late in World War II, Cor the Corsair's excellent record in air-to-air -air combat made it the only U.S. piston engine fighter to remain in production during the Korean War. Tonight, soar high in the chance-bought F4U Corsair on wing. The last and possibly the greatest propeller-driven fighter aircraft was the Vought F4U Corsair I. With their bent wings, the Corsairs are instantly recognizable. But the full extent of their capability is generally not as well recognized as that of other more famous types. However, the F4U could not only outfight the best of the Axis fighters, but also those on the Allied side. They were powerful, fast, well-armed, strong, and reliable. Ideal fighters. At the end of the war, orders for most aircraft types were cancelled, but the F4U remained at the heart of the busy development and production program. For those who like to argue the relative merits of World War II fighters, this continued development indicates the high regard in which it was held by the U.S. Navy and Marines. The Corsair not only continued in production and use into the jet age, but in Korea, they encountered jet fighters in combat, and the outcome was not always to the jet's liking. The F4U's peculiar wing reflects the nature of the team that designed it. Vought engineers have often resorted to the unconventional where it worked, perhaps reflecting the age of the company. Founded in June of 1917, Vought is the second oldest surviving aircraft company next to Boeing. Back in those days, intuition was as reliable as science in aircraft design, and Vought has never been in the habit of dismissing the unusual too hastily. Over the years, the company has made a tremendous contribution to aviation in general, and in particular, to United States Naval Aircraft. The first aircraft to take off from the deck of the U.S. Navy's original aircraft carrier, the Langley, on October 17, 1922, was a Vought plane, a VE-7. This was only one of a number of such historic events for the company. Earlier, VE-7s had equipped the Navy's first two fighter squadrons. The relationship between the Navy and the company has persevered to the benefit of both. The company's founder was Chance Milton Vaught, born in New York on the 26th of February, 1890. His father built sailing ships for a living, but the young man turned away from the sea after completing his mechanical engineering studies, and in 1910 started his association with flying machines. Chance Vought died young in 1930, but by then he had built a thriving enterprise that has survived several moves around the U.S. as well as changes of ownership and management. The company's reputation for outstanding aircraft stretches back to their earliest designs, and the F4U was to continue this tradition. The company's first plane was built in a third floor room of a disused ladies' stocking factory. It was lowered to the street in sections out of the windows, and then reassembled so the engine could be tested with the plane tethered to a telephone pole. Despite this unusual birth, it was a very successful design. The plane was the VE-7. VE for Vought Experimental, and 7 because it was Chance Vought's seventh design. It was modestly described as a two-seat advanced train. But its reception by Army pilots in February 1918 was so favorable that it was ordered into mass production 
as a fighter. After the war's end, some production of the VE-7 continued, including the first orders for the Navy. Several versions found their way into Navy use. There were twin-seat observation and float planes and the single-seat fighters. Vought's next plane, the VE-8, was similar to the VE-7 in many respects. The company drew from the VE-7 in different ways, and the VE-7 family were produced into the 1930s though not as a fighter. Vought continued to work on fighter designs, but to little avail. These aircraft were very impressive and included the company's first all-metal plane. However, they were failures in the marketplace, and Vought was only kept alive by its successful sales of other aircraft, including a succession of observation planes called the Corsairs. This is a name that has become very closely associated with Vought. Through the 20s and even the 30s, the Vought company quietly prospered. It was small and sometimes struggled to meet orders, but it continued to have successful designs under production. These included the Vindicator light bomber and the Kingfisher catapult plane, but a successful fighter design continued to elude them. The V-141 was a spectacular failure. Against engineering protests, the president of the corporation bought a questionable Northrop fighter design. Two test versions, under evaluation by the Army and Navy in 1935, had disappeared without a trace. The plane had appalling spin recovery, and despite the best efforts of the Vought men, it remained dangerous. Renamed the V-143 after stretching, being given a new tail, it still failed to impress any buyers. To recoup some of the loss, the plans were eventually sold to Japan, a decision the Japanese probably regretted from then on. The Vought Company vowed to stick to its own designs in the future. Meanwhile, in 1936, the company's chief engineer, Rex Beisel, had commenced work on another fighter for the Navy. The design was completed and submitted in 1938. This would be the firm's sixth fighter submission and the first one to be successful. Within the company, it was referred to as the V-166, but it was accepted for testing as the XF-4U. Beisel had devised the smallest practical aircraft around a Pratt & Whitney project for a gigantic supercharged double wasp radial engine that would deliver 1,800 horsepower. At the time, this was the world's most powerful engine. After one major change to place a fuel tank ahead of the cockpit, the design solidified and became what was to remain unmistakably the F4U Corsair. Once you got it in the air, it was a very tender airplane to fly. It was very, very soft touch bird. It was one of the most more pleasant birds in the airplanes that I've flown in, in my life. The course it was good. It would be over four years after the first test order before the first production plane was delivered. In those four years, Europe had slid into a war that engulfed the world. With war raging, the company's pilots, who took the early production planes for test flights, did so certain that the Corsair would soon see combat. They appreciated the ability of the plane and were eager for it to gain wider recognition. On the 1st of October, 1940, the original X-plane became the first U.S. fighter to fly at over 400 miles per hour in level flight. This not only justified faith in the radial engine, but it confirmed for the Navy that this was the plane needed to fill the role of carrier fighter. The huge engine was not only central to the performance of the plane, it had a big effect on the way the plane came to look. It was matched to a very large three-bladed propeller, 
At 13 feet 4 inches, it was the largest on any fighter at that time. By comparison, the Messerschmitt 109 had a diameter just under 10 feet. The Vought Company was affiliated with Sikorsky under the umbrella of the United Aircraft Corporation. Pratt & Whitney, the makers of the plane's engine, were also part of the corporation. And so was the manufacturer of the Corsair's propeller, the Hamilton Standard Company. It's always easy to forget that today's old hat was yesterday's high tech. This is particularly so with something as outdated as a fighter's propeller. No matter how fine the engine, it was designed to do only one thing, drive a propeller. And it was a design test to match prop to power plant in order to get the best out of a plane. The Hamilton Standard Company employed the highest technology in the field. The props were built around a cold, stretched steel core with the skins then welded on with silver. The technology produced very exact results and enduring shape. As with all aspects of aircraft technology, propeller design was a combination of experience, knowledge, and testing. This is a constant process of refinement, and the Corsair was the last great achievement of a specific technology, prop-driven fighters. The Corsair's power plant was a twin-row, 18-cylinder air-cooled radial engine. With an initial bore of 5 and 3 quarter inches and stroke of 6 inches, it had a capacity of 2,804 cubic inches. By the end of the war, Pratt & Whitney engines were being produced at over 30 plants in the USA. 26 of these were within the company's control, and six other companies were producing the engines on a nominal wartime license fee. Pre-war fashions had dictated that the air-cooled engine was on the way out in the face of the liquid-cooled inline power plants favored by the Europeans. However, for carrier use, the radial offered advantages in weight, maintenance, and supplies that justified its continued use. Despite the fashion of the times, two of the United States' best fighters of the war, and the first two to exceed 400 miles per hour, the P-47 Thunderbolt and the Corsair, had radial engines. The F-4U was designed to be a brutally effective fighter, but it was not an easy airplane to land, a point of concern that led to delays in its full acceptance into service. Navy, there was no doubt about the plane's outstanding performance as a fighter, but there was a growing concern. Was it safe to operate from carriers? Landings on carriers have to take place very quickly and very precisely. Otherwise, you've not landed, you've crashed. One of the results of this is that pilots tend to slam the planes down hard, looking for a successful hooking. The pilot needs good visibility to position the plane and a strong plane to withstand the shock. 
the Vought engineers, with their long-standing relationship with the Navy, knew all about the business of carrier landings. They also knew all the things that could go wrong. The Navy filmed every landing on its carriers, and the collapsing of landing gear was captured on a lot of Navy film. The Vought designers had studied the behavior of aircraft under these extreme stresses closely, particularly since so many of the planes in Navy use were Vought designs. Even with slow and steady biplanes, landing on a ship was an exercise of considerable violence. There were remedies to the problem, including better landing gear, maximizing pilot visibility, and improving pilot training. The pilots were always going to be under stress while landing, and the responsibility rested with aircraft designers to lessen the dangers. Further, the Navy was very cautious about anything that might increase the demand on the pilot. The F-4U was designed from the outset as a carrier fighter, and as a result, much consideration had gone into making its landing gear as strong as possible. The huge propeller demanded a lot of ground clearance. This would have meant a very high landing gear. The inverted gull wings were specifically designed to compensate. An unconventional wing was no obstacle to the Vought team. A fighter needed as much power as possible, and if this could be best delivered with a strange wing, then so be it. But the Navy was not convinced about the airplane's carrier safety. The cockpit was pushed a long way back down the fuselage, and visibility in landing was restricted. This meant that pilots would be blind on final approach. The landing gear would be taking stresses above the normal, and the pilots would be concentrating more than was necessary with other types. Despite impressively successful trials, the Navy was reluctant to commit its carriers to the Corsair's protection. The Grumman F6F Hellcat, a much more conventional plane, was preferred. Though designed as a carrier plane, the first U.S. Corsairs were restricted to land-based service with the Marines. In my career in the Navy, I've flown two airplanes that I consider to be perfect carrier aircraft. The first was the F-4U Corsair, and the last was the F-4 Phantom. They were both magnificent airplanes to come aboard ship in. The Pacific Theater with its great distances and scattered islands, was dominated by air power. The possession of airstrips would shape the course of the fighting, culminating in the island-hopping thrust which broke into the Japanese Empire. The first of the major battles was fought around the airstrip at Longa Point, on the island of Guadalcanal. The Japanese had begun work on the field and the object of the Allied invasion had been to seize the field before Japanese planes could start to use it. As soon as the Marines went ashore, this was their target, and the airfield was to be the center of protracted fighting over the following five months. So desperate was the fighting that despite the danger, planes were operating from the strip before it was finished. The Marines were equipped with a selection of Navy types, including the Grumman F-4F Wildcat as fighters. The Grummans were clearly outclassed by the Zero, and the Marine pilots relied on tactics and teamwork to hold their own with the Japanese. Throughout the campaign, the Japanese repeatedly made the mistake of underestimating the American strength around Guadalcanal. In a process of continuing small deployments, they committed a sizable total of men and machines to the battle. Had it all been committed to the battle at once, it may have been overwhelming. Instead, it was deployed in small packages and was mercilessly cut up by the U.S. forces. The cost to the U.S. was high, but the Japanese losses 
were far greater. The airstrip on Guadalcanal, renamed Henderson Field, was completed and turned into a major asset in the continuing fighting in the Solomon Islands. Steel matting stabilized the surface and made operations safe. Green settled in to a long occupation. When the Japanese gave up their attempts to evict the Marines from Guadalcanal in January 1943, they had already suffered severe losses. However, Japan continued to deploy strong forces. At that time, they still had planes that outclassed their American opponents, though pilot losses were eroding their efficiency. The contest was far from over, and there was bitter fighting ahead. Soon, the first Corsairs arrived in the theater to play their part in the country. The Marines were well aware of the reservations about the Corsair and initially approached their new planes with caution. This evaporated quickly as the experience of flying the F-4U convinced the pilots of the machine's worth. Marine pilots were soon proudly asserting that they were flying the best fighter in the world. Eventually, their voices would be heard. On the 12th of February, 1943, the Corsair's combat career opened with the arrival of a squadron at Henderson Field. By nightfall, most of the pilots had logged nine hours in action. The next day, they escorted bombers to Bougainville, a mission that had previously been out of the question because of the short range of the available fighters. The Corsair's arrival changed a lot of things. Typical of the wartime Marine bases, Conditions at Henderson remained fairly primitive, with most servicing being carried out in the open or in tents. The Corsairs were maintained and armed, refueled, and turned around fast. As both shield and aggressive forces, they had to be constantly available. The first squadron on Guadalcanal, VMF-124, established the Corsair as a success. In their tour of duty, they shot down 68 Japanese planes against losses of 11 Corsairs and three pilots. The squadron provided the first F-4U ace, Lieutenant Kenneth Walsh, who downed his fifth plane on the 30 combat victories confirmed. The Corsairs were now being produced in large numbers, and the enthusiastic Marines welcomed them. The F-4Us played very little part in the European theater, but in the Pacific, they came to be a dominant factor in the combat. Throughout the long slogging campaign through the islands, the Corsairs gave the Marines the edge over the best of the Japanese types. In addition to securing air superiority, they were used as successful fighter bombers in close support of ground forces. In April of 1943, the first Navy Corsair squadron went into action. This was VF-17. The planes were still not cleared for carrier use, but were flown from land bases. In 79 days, the Corsair shot down 154 aircraft. Twelve of the squadron's pilots became aces. In May, in a letter to the Vought Company, Admiral Nimitz stated, the battles which are being waged daily in the South Pacific have already proved that the Corsair is a better plane than any version of the Zero. The Corsairs were armed with either six half-inch machine guns or four 20-millimeter cannon. Against the lightly framed Japanese types, this gave the F-4U a devastating attack. In contrast to the fragility of the Japanese planes, the F-4U was built tough to absorb damage and hang together. The huge engine provided power to handle the weight of the armor. 
self-sealing tanks and solid structure were incorporated into the plane. The Japanese pilot needed a lot of luck or a lot of persistence to bring a Corsair down. In the hands of the Marines, the Corsairs built up a formidable reputation in air-to-air -air combat. The Japanese recognized the significance of the Corsair's arrival. They had lost the superiority they had enjoyed with the Zero, and they would have little chance to reclaim it. Victory rolls and swoops above Corsair bases were frequent as pilots celebrated their successes. Nine thousand four hundred and forty-one F4U-1s were produced. This number included several subtypes and numerous modifications. Altogether, five hundred major engineering changes and over twenty-five hundred minor alterations were made during the production of the F4U-1s. Corsairs were to be used by several countries during the war, and in particular, well over 2,000 were obtained by the British for use with their fleet air arm. In contrast to the U.S. Navy, the English were quick to seize upon the potency of the plane. Whether it had ideal landing characteristics was secondary to its demonstrable power. Accordingly, they deployed the Corsair to their carriers. British enthusiasm was to have a strongly persuasive effect when the U.S. Navy came to reconsider the Corsair for its carriers. The British had been pioneers in carrier aviation and had been very influential in its development. British experimentation and theorizing had led the way. And their opinions were treated with respect. In spite of their staid reputation, the British were often highly adventurous. Reducing the concept of a floating runway to the bare minimum is indicative of this, although it also reflects a perhaps more indifferent approach to aircrew losses. Certainly, the British were not daunted by the Corsair. They were soon flying them from tiny escort carriers after cutting eight inches off the wings to make them fit below decks. The British did not have an easy time of it at first. The pilot's seat was too low, and this, combined with being so far back, meant that the pilot had very poor visibility. In addition, the undercarriage had too much bounce. These were the very factors that had influenced the U.S. Navy to reject the plane for carrier use. The British persisted in carrier trials and addressed the worst aspects of the design by adopting a curving landing approach. With the pilot losing sight of the deck only at the last moment, landings improved. Later modifications to raise the pilot's seat and stiffen the landing gear further reduced the risk in landing. You, you could pound into the deck, hit it, do whatever you wanted to to it, and shudder a little bit, catch a wire, and that was it. You know, push it back and do it again. Marvelous carrier. I think. It was a classic looking aircraft in my view. I still think it is. Uh, something about that gull wing, something about that plane uh, makes it uh, an attractive bird to fly. And uh, you felt good when you were flying it, at least I did. In April 1944, reacting to the British experience and the enthusiasm of marine pilots, the U.S. Navy began a new series of Corsair trials aboard the escort carrier Gambia Bay. The success of these trials eventually worked to reverse the earlier decision F4U was cleared for carrier service. The first Corsairs to operate from U.S. carriers in action had actually been land-based Navy planes, flown onto carriers to refuel and rearm on the 11th of November, 1943. There had been other isolated incidents of Corsairs damaged to low on fuel landing on the ships. 
The first U.S. carrier-based squadron went into action on the 3rd of January, 1945, at Okinawa. These were Marine pilots with Corsair experience who had been redeployed to fly from the USS Essex. The Corsairs were simply the most formidable fighter aircraft available, and the Navy had great need for them. The fury of kamikaze attacks that had started in the Philippines would continue to the end of the war, and the Corsairs, as interceptors, were the best available forward defense. In the course of the Pacific fighting, U.S. Corsairs shot down 2,140 Japanese planes. The Marines shot down over 1,600 of these. In return, 189 Corsairs were lost in air-to-air -air combat. This gives a ratio of over 11 to 1 in the Corsairs' favor. In addition to the air-to-air -air losses, anti-aircraft fire and other causes saw a total of 768 American F-4Us lost in action. When the F-4Us entered carrier service in the lead up to the Okinawa invasion, their primary mission was the protection of the Allied task forces from the growing menace of kamikaze attacks. Kamikazes confirmed the fears of the U.S. about Japanese fanaticism. Japanese soldiers had stunned their American opponents in fighting to the last man. Japanese sailors had swum away from ships trying to rescue them in shark-infested waters. Now, in the death throes of the Empire, young men were flying their aircraft as guided bombs to crash into Allied ships. This was a truly alien and threatening phenomenon. Despite their losses, the kamikaze attacks did cause havoc. Even if 90% of an attacking force was shot down, the remaining 10% was still potentially lethal. The only ships relatively impervious to the raids were the battleships and some of the British carriers with armored decks. The attacks were so frequent and sometimes in such large numbers that the Allied fleets had to absorb a lot of damage. But at no stage did the campaign have any chance of affecting the outcome of the war. The Allied resources were far too great, and Japan, by then, so weakened. The Corsair's arrival on the carriers coincided with a crescendo of kamikaze missions. Around Okinawa, the Japanese defiantly threw in massed raids as well as the normal smaller ones. Ten massed attacks totaled some 1,500 sorties out of a total of around 3,000 attacks in three months. Over 400 ships were hit. This works out at around one strike for every eight aircraft lost. If the Japanese had not run out of aircraft first, they would eventually have run out of volunteers. Despite the success of the Corsairs in intercepting the incoming attacks, the kamikaze still got through in significant numbers. With F-4Us now flying from all carrier task groups, some Corsairs also burned in the kamikaze flames. The best place for a burning plane is somewhere astern, underwater. Damage and fire control became the finely honed skills of professionals in the course of the war. Early carrier losses on both sides had reflected a certain neglect of the importance of these measures. By 1945, this had been repeatedly tested and tempered in the all-too-real fires of practice. U.S. Corsairs conducted a total of over 4,500 attacks on Japanese shipping with over 500 of these against warships. 
the hammering of the F-4U's guns on unarmored merchantmen was highly effective. Even armored ships were vulnerable to attack with rockets and bombs. By the end of the war, the term Japanese transport had become a contradiction. The havoc at sea and on land caused by the unchecked rampage of Allied aircraft was total. The end of the war coincided with a critical moment in the history of aviation. With the arrival of the jet, propeller-driven aircraft were suddenly aerodynamically inefficient. The U.S. didn't want the Royal Navy Lend-Lease Corsairs, and the British didn't want to pay for them. To satisfy the letter of the law, it was agreed that the British pushed them over the side. Everyone was cutting back military establishment. In particular, everyone was cutting back on propeller-driven aircraft. The U.S. Navy and Marines chose the Corsair as the plane they wanted to keep on. And it was not just a question of the wartime aircraft. New models would be developed and produced. The F-4U was still being produced and back-flying combat missions in America's next war, Korea. The constant close intervention of the Corsairs, operating from the carriers and from within the encirclement at Pusan, was an important factor in that war. With the other World War II types, like the Mustangs and Invaders, the F-4Us could carry large loads and loiter for hours. They could deliver accurate close support and tie up road and rail links. They were, during the war, to largely destroy one army and cripple another. As had so often been the case during World War II, the carriers played a major part in asserting control of the skies over Korea. This was ultimately decisive. China's massive reserves could not realistically be risked under the fierce umbrella of American air superiority. The Chinese had to balance their losses in maintaining the stalemate that developed. Even then, Chinese and North Korean casualties were enormous. From its earliest manifestations as a fighter aircraft, the Corsair had grown remarkably diverse. The Marines had turned it into a dive bomber and rocket platform. By the time of Korea, it could be armed with napalm, 4,000 pounds of bombs, or 10 rockets. This was in addition to its four 20-millimeter cannon. The carrier attack squadrons of Corsairs and Douglas Skyraiders provided a powerful mixture. The closely coordinated activities of the Marines in Korea also served to illustrate the outstanding virtues of the Corsair. The big workhorses handled the unsophisticated strips and their buckling matting without complaint. But the severity of the winter caused many problems. There were periods of the war when all aerial activity was suspended. The planes were frozen. By the same token, even the Chinese could not make very much progress in conditions like these. The demand for the Corsair services was such that during the war, many of the planes were recalled from reserve units for use in combat. Their virtues in the close support role were unmatched. The Navy needed them in the front line. Perhaps there were some regrets about the heap of ex-British Corsairs rusting deep in the Pacific. 
During the critical period of the first 10 months of the war, Corsairs flew 82% of the Navy and Marine's tactical support missions. One squadron, VNF-323, flew over 1,100 missions in a month. The first Corsair strikes in the war took place on the 3rd of July, 1950, only eight days after the outbreak of hostilities. This saw the beginning of a series of successful raids on northern transport and supply. In addition, the North's airfields were put out of operation and the North Korean Air Force crippled. In August 1952, Captain Jesse G. Fulm, 15, with a propeller-driven plane. But he had written another chapter into the F-4U's legend. Airstrikes by U.S. Marines and Navy Corsairs continued up to the last day of the conflict, the 27th of July, 1953. By the end of the war, the Corsair's days were clearly numbered. Production had finally ceased in December 1952, and the last Corsairs in fighter and attack squadron service were relegated to reserve units in December 1954. The reserves would fly them until 1957, and the French continued to use them until October 1964, an impressive set of dates for a 1938 design. In Korea, jets were new and still developing, whereas props were well established and refined. F-4Us did the desperate defensive work early in the campaign, and the aggressive work of the latter phases equally convincingly. Post-war models had increasingly reflected the needs of ground attack and had shed the trappings of the fighter. The Corsairs had become even tougher, but at the cost of some performance. Both Japanese and American pilots acknowledge the Corsair as the Allies' finest fighter and also agree they were better than anything the Japanese had. Their limited impact in Europe has seen them often overlooked in the World War's finest fighter stakes. In this debate, protagonists often brandish the merits of the Focke-Wolfs, Mustangs and Spitfires. This tends to reflect the European experience. Veterans from the Pacific campaigns, the Marines in particular, often support a different nominee, the Chance Vought Corsair. 